Well, here we are at another day, and we're going to talk about peace with God again. Uh, and so um, I'm going to do a lecture from the book of Romans, chapter 5. And so I want to share my screen with you all. So let's do that now, and then we'll begin. Peace with God, number two, three, four, five. We, we'll talk about this a lot. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the declared righteous by faith, sometimes you'll see the word justified and vast buzz, um, and the idea of this we'll talk about, but I use this translation. This is the translation we'd be using if we were in the classroom. Now, Romans 5, 1 has four parts to it. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous, that's the first part. By faith is the second part. We have peace with God is the third part. Through our Lord Jesus Christ is the fourth part. And so we're going to look at each one of these parts just simply and straightforward. It's not difficult or anything. So we start. Declared righteous by faith, peace with God, and through Jesus Christ. So we'll start with declared righteous. What does that mean? Therefore, since we have been declared righteous. Okay, so it's because of our faith in Jesus Christ. When we stand before God, God says that we are in a right relationship with him. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. Because to be in a right relationship with God means that all of our sins are no longer blocking the way between us and God. And, and all of the things that we've done, which are so many different things that we've done that make us unclean and unable to stand before God. Because if you are, if you come into the presence of God and you're unclean, you'll be destroyed because God is holy. And that's what holiness does. And so we can do that though. We can stand in the presence of God and we don't have to be afraid of being in the presence of God. Why? Because we're in a right relationship with him. And that's what it means when it says declared righteous. It means this is a person who has a right relationship with God so that if God appeared in a room and all of his glory, oh, remember that burning fire in that video, all of the burning fire of God's glory, but a person who has been declared righteous can stand in the presence of God because they're in a right relationship with God. Everybody else is in a wrong relationship with God. Why? Because of sin. Sin is what destroys the relationship. So when did we come to have this right relationship with God? This is the real question. So if it was only in the past, we had been made right with God. Is it gone? Well, that's what happens to a lot of people. They have, they go to a convention and, they're invited to come forward or they're invited to raise their hands or to stand up and to receive Jesus Christ and pray a prayer. And then later on, they say, do I still have that? I mean, I've talked to people, lots and lots of people in America, but I'm sure it's true in Pakistan too. They say, oh, I prayed that prayer. And I mean, I, I talked to a, uh, we were sharing the gospel with a prostitute once in America. And she said, oh yeah, I, I, I prayed the prayer. I got Jesus right here. She was a prostitute. I mean, it, it wasn't like she prayed the prayer and got Jesus right here and, and then left that life. No, no, she continued in that lifestyle. And my point is, it's possible to do something in the past and not to have it in the present. Is that what peace with God is all about? Is that this right relationship? If it's in the present, does it mean I'm being made right with God now? So, I mean, I got to do this. And I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this. I got to do all these things in order to make myself right with God. Remember in the in the video, the cartoon, he, he goes to church, he talks about his family, he fasts, he fasts more, and he's doing all of these things to try to get peace with God. And lots of people feel like they're being made right with God by doing good works, by going to church, by praying, by fasting. They're being made right with God. And is that what it means? Or is it future? We will be made right with God. If, if we do everything right, if we do everything 100% right, and we do, or, or 
50.001% right, or we do mostly good, then we'll be made right with God. I, lots of people believe that. They're not sure about the future. They hope, they think that doing lots of good stuff is it going to be enough. But it's all three past, present, and future. We're made right in the past. We're made right for the present. We're made right for the future. The whole idea of having been justified, having been made right, is that it was done in the past. It's right for the present. And we will be right in the future. We have been made right with God. We were made right with God in the past. We have been made right with God in the past. And therefore, we are in a right relationship with him now, today, here. There's nothing between us. If God would appear in this room and all that holy fire, because we had been made right in the past, we were made right in the past. We are still right with God in the present. And in the future, we have been made right with God in the past, and therefore we'll be in a right relationship with Him in the future forever. What happened in the past affects the present and guarantees the future. That's what it means to be made right with God. So Romans has these four parts to it. And the second, the first part is being made right with God, declared righteous. The second part is by faith. Okay, this is really important. And I want you to hear this. And I don't know, it's really hard to get this into our minds because we think of faith as like, oh, I believe, oh, I believe, oh, I believe. That's what we're trying to do with faith. It's we're trying to make ourselves believe. That's the deal with all the music and conventions. Why do we have that fabulous music that's so exciting and full of power? That, that, that music is just music. Music is music is music. Why do, why do we do that? Because we're trying to drum up. We're trying to create faith within us. So I have enough faith to believe. But that's not the kind of faith you need for salvation. Jesus said you need the faith the side of a tiny little mustard seed. You don't need like... I've got so much faith. You don't need that in order to be saved. You, you need faith that says, I have nobody else who can bring me peace with God. Only Jesus. I have nowhere else to turn to find peace with God. Only Jesus. I have Nothing else I can do to find peace with God. All I have is Jesus. In the video, there's just one kind of little thing that you might not have noticed. Um, Sam says, Lord, isn't there anything I can do to get peace with God? And Jesus says, no, Sam, nothing. And you go, wait a minute. But he gets peace with God. That's right. He didn't do anything. We're always trying to do something. We're always trying to go somewhere. We're always trying to trust somebody. But here, here, it's just nobody else, only Jesus. Nowhere else, only Jesus. Nothing else, only Jesus. And we have to keep that always in front of us. I believe your promise that you will bring me peace with God. It's the promise. It's the promise. And it's the fact that I have nobody else, nowhere else, nothing else. It's just Jesus. And I realize that all those other things are not going to work. If I say to myself, nobody else except Jesus and Mary, you come to God and you pray. And you pray to Mary. Now, I want you to think about this. What are you saying? You're saying that Jesus is not enough. If Jesus were not enough, if Jesus were enough, you wouldn't be praying to Mary. Right? If he were enough, you wouldn't be praying to Mary. You'd be praying to Jesus because he's all you need to have peace with God. 
but you got some kind of belief somewhere inside of your brain that Jesus is not enough. You need somebody else. So that doesn't work. That's not saving faith. If you're praying to Mary, that's not saving faith because it's not nobody else. It's Jesus and Mary or Jesus and pastors. It, uh, it's okay to ask a pastor to pray for you and ask my pastor to pray for me many times. Um, it's not a problem at all. I was a pastor. People asked me to pray for them. No problem. When I'm in church, people ask me to pray for them. Somebody asked me um, yesterday. In fact, I can remember to do that. I put it in my mirror there to remember to pray for him for surgery. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's fine. But you got to get something in your brain. You got to get something in your brain. If you think that asking a pastor to pray for you will somehow be better than just praying yourself, then it's not nobody else. It's good to ask other people to pray. Paul asked people to pray for him. It's fine. It's good. It's wholesome. Jesus asked the disciples eh, probably to pray for themselves. But he did say, watch and pray with me. So probably. But you know what? If you think that somehow God's going to hear your pastor's prayer more than you, then it's Jesus and your pastor. It's just not Jesus by himself. Ask other people to pray for you. But if you're trusting other people instead of trusting Jesus alone, then it's not only Jesus or saints. Same thing with saints or family. I'm, I'm not at all in any way saying, oh, get rid of your family. I'm totally not. I'm saying this. If you think that when you appear before God, well, my father was a pastor, my father was a bishop. If you think that's going to somehow help you with God, that peace with God. No, it's only Jesus. And if you think you have to like lean back on your family, then you're not really trusting in Jesus. You're trusting in Jesus and your family. If I say nowhere else except Jesus in church, like going to church and praying in church, somehow more spiritual than praying at home no no that's not true it's not only jesus and church it's not like well i need to go to church in order to pray i i need to go to church to ask god to do something i, I that the church is a holier place than than jesus yeah that's what you're saying that the church is a holier place than jesus yeah you know jesus you're holy but the church is even holier yeah, yeah, I know that I've been crucified with you. I know I've been buried with you. I know I've been raised with you. I know I'm in you. But the church is holier than being in you. So therefore, I get closer to God when I go to church. No, you don't get closer to God when you go to church. How could you get closer to God when you go to church? People sometimes go to Israel and they want to be baptized. Or not to Israel, but to Jordan. They want to be baptized in the Jordan River. And sometimes people will wait to be baptized. Christians will wait to be baptized until they get baptized in the Jordan River. Going someplace else other than to Jesus in order to get peace with God. Going someplace else other than to Jesus in order to get peace with God. It's not Jesus and baptism in the Jordan River. It's Jesus. Bus. Bus. It's Jesus. If I have Jesus, I don't have any other place to go. I can't go to Jordan. And if I could, it wouldn't make any difference. I can't get any closer to God than being in you. And I need to be close to God. Conventions. I'm going to go to this convention because I want to meet with God. No, 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 no. You don't meet with God at conventions. You meet with God in Jesus. He's the place where you meet with God. Always. Well, do I stop going to church? No, you go to church. I go to church right now. Because of COVID, I'm going to church online. But every week I go to two church services, my American church and my Pakistani church, every week. And I can't wait to get back to be in Pakistan and be with my fellowship at our church, ICF, and on campus at, I, at, at Foreman Christian College. I can't wait to get back and be in fellowship again with my brothers and sisters. So I love church, but that's not where I find Jesus. I don't find God at church. I find God in Jesus. That's where God is. He's in Jesus. So my peace with God is not based upon whether I'm in church or not. My peace with God is not based upon whether I'm in conventions or not. My peace with God is based upon being with Jesus. Holy places. No, no. There's no such thing. Jesus is the holy place. Jesus 
is the holy place. I'm going to meet with God in Jesus. Going to church, going to a convention, going to a uh, place that's like some saint or some whatever, some miracle happened there. No, 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 no. It's Jesus. That's the place that I go. I don't have any other place to go. There's nowhere else except Jesus. That's where closeness to God is. Nothing else except Jesus, not in fasting. You don't put fasting as a part of it. Fasting does not make you close to God. You can't fast away your sin. It doesn't work because God is a holy God. Your sin is still there. God isn't blind. God isn't blind. Fasting does not take away your sin. Fasting doesn't get you close to God. Jesus gets you close to God. It's not like, oh, I need Jesus and fasting. No, no, fasting, that doesn't mean you shouldn't fast. I fast sometimes. I fast when I'm asking God for wisdom or when I'm repenting from something, I'll fast. It's fine to do that. That's good. It's biblical. It's fine. Jesus didn't fast very much. I know he did that one time, but he didn't fast except for that one time that we know about. I don't think he did. Instead, because they say, why is it that you and your disciples don't fast? It's like, well, don't need to. You don't get close to God in fasting. You repent from sin and you use fasting as a way to repent from sin or you mourn about something but not to get close to God. You don't get close to God through fasting. You get close to God through trusting in Jesus. He's your closest to God. You can't get any closer to God than being in Jesus. What? You don't get close to God through prayer. No, that's not. That's, how is that possible? What is? You don't get close to God through prayer. You get close to God through Jesus. Yeah, through Jesus. I, I pray. I pray all the time. But that's not how I get close to God. I get, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, I really believe this. And this is what the Bible teaches. I get close to God in Jesus. I approach God in Jesus. I have peace with God in Jesus. I have fellowship with God in Jesus. Jesus is what I have. Therefore, I can't get any closer to God. And if I pray 10 hours a day, I won't be any closer to God than before I started praying. If I pray for 100 hours a day, which is, by the way, impossible, but if I pray for 22 hours in a day, I wouldn't be any closer to God at the end of that day as I was at the beginning. Because prayer does not make you close to God. Your closeness to God is in Jesus. That's how you get close to God. And obedience? Do I get close to God through my obedience? No. They asked Jesus, what is the work that God would have us do? And Jesus said, believe in the one whom he has sent. Believe. Not obedience. Obedience doesn't get you close to God. It's Jesus who gets you close to God. No, not obedience. Oh, then I can just sin all I want. That's a different subject. We'll talk about that. Don't worry. We're going to talk about that a lot. But obedience does not get you close to God. Obedience does not get you close to God because your peace with God is not Jesus and obedience. Your peace with God is Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. Bus, 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 bus. It's only Jesus and nothing else. Passion doesn't get you close to God. You know, you listen to music, you listen to Christian music, and it's like, gets you all excited and everything like that. But that passion that you feel when you get all excited by music does not get you close to God. You can't get any closer to God than you are in Jesus. And being passionate about Jesus doesn't get you any closer to God. I'm a very passionate person. That doesn't get me any closer to God at all, not even a little bit. My passion is irrelevant to whether I'm close to God. Well, you say, well, if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, you will have passion. Is that true? Is that what you see of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane who says, Father, if there's any way that this cup's, cup can pass from me, please take it away. But if not, your will be done. That's not passion. That's terror. Is Jesus not being spiritual? No, Jesus is being Jesus. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. Jesus cries out as he's dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is not passion. That's not passion. 
passion doesn't bring you close to God. Is passion wrong? No. But if you trust in him, let's say, for example, that you listen to music, you feel really good. So I'm really close to God today. Well, then you're trusting in something beyond Jesus. Now, I wanted to say, we do this all the time, all the time, all the time. We're always doing this. We're always trusting in other things. But the faith that saves is a faith that says it's only Jesus and nothing else. At a particular time in the past, we believed that Jesus was our only hope for peace with God. But all the other stuff, all the religion, all of the church services, all the prayers, all the fasting, that none of those things brought peace with God, that only Jesus brought peace with God. Because we believe this, God gave us a right relationship with him. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did all those things. They prayed. They went to their synagogue. Same thing as the church. They fasted lots. They prayed lots. They gave their tithe lots. They obeyed the law lots. But it didn't give them peace with God. When God showed up, they crucified him. Yeah, see, because those things do not bring you close to God. Because your sin is always an enormous wall. And if you actually come into God's presence, you'll be burned up in that fire of God's holiness. The only way you can have peace with God is through faith that Jesus is your only hope. And if you're like the Pharisees and you do all these really cool religious things that everybody says you're supposed to do, and that's what you think will get you close to God, it may be that you don't really see that Jesus is your only hope for peace with God. It could be that you think that it's your fasting or your praying or your praying a prayer of sinners or it's the fact that you're passionate about Jesus or the fact that your father's a pastor or a bishop or an archbishop or whatever. And you think that those things are, are going to somehow give you peace with God. But they won't. And so what you need to do is come to the fact and face the reality that you have no one else to turn to. You have nothing else you can do. You have nowhere you can go. The only way you're going to be close to God, the only way you're going to find peace with God is through Jesus Christ. Not because we had some spiritual experience. It's not because we prayed a certain prayer. It's not because we came forward in a convention. It was because we believed we had nowhere else to go except Jesus. That's saving faith. That's what it means to have faith. That's what Jesus said is the work of God to believe in him. So Romans 5, 1 has four parts to it. We have peace with God. The word peace, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And this word is an awesome word. There's nothing blocking our relationship with God. No. This is the coolest thing in the world. There's nothing. If you, if you have been declared righteous, if you've been declared in a right relationship with God because you come to Jesus, I don't have anywhere else to go. God makes you right with him. And you're at peace. There's nothing blocking your relationship with God. Oh, yeah, but I was really rude to my mother. Yes, you, you need to deal with sin. We'll talk about that. But that doesn't keep you from having peace with God. Oh, yeah, but, you know, I cheated on that exam. Well, that, you don't have peace with your professor, but you do have peace with God. Oh, oh, yeah, but I've been so down lately. But you still have peace with God. There's nothing blocking your relationship with God that we have a very good and perfectly healthy relationship with God because of something that happened in the past. In the past, God declared us to be righteous because we believed that we had nowhere else to go, no one else to turn to, nothing else we can do, just Jesus. And when we did that, God said, you have peace with me. Nothing's blocking your relationship. You have a healthy relationship with me. Everything is exactly the way I intended it to be. That's what peace means. You have peace with God. You say, but I don't feel peace. Well, we're not Hindus. 
Hindus meditate to give themselves peace. Jesus died on the cross to give you peace. See the difference? A Hindu will chant a mantra and will practice yoga in order to get inner peace. Jesus suffered beating and nails pierced through his wrists and six hours of torture to bear all of your sins, which were the thing blocking your relationship with God, which gave you a very bad and perfectly unhealthy relationship with God, so that you were exactly not what God intended you to be. Took all of those sins in his body on the cross, and God put you into his body on the cross. And Jesus was crucified. You were crucified with him. Jesus was buried. You were buried with him. Jesus then rose from the dead on the third day. You rose with him. God raised him up and he seated him at his right hand. God seated you with him. If you've been declared right, if you've been made righteous, if you've been declared righteous through believing that there's no one else to go to, you have peace today, now, because your peace is in Jesus. It's not in what you do. Your peace is in Jesus. It's not in what you do. And it's nothing blocking, perfectly healthy, exactly as God always intended it to be. And that's the word shalom. And we've already said this through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we, since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one pathway to peace. We must come to God through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, resurrection from the dead. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe that? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe that with all your heart? When we add things in order to get close to God, we are not trusting in Jesus. If we add prayer or fasting or obedience or law or passion or church, singing praises, miracles, power, these, we do these things to mature, but not to get close to God. If we are in Christ, we cannot get any closer to God than we are right now. It's Jesus. It's ever only Jesus. He's your peace with God. He's your relationship with God. He's your closeness to God. How do, how, where do I go to get close to God? I go to Jesus. What do I do to get close to God? I trust in Jesus. There's nothing else. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. And I promise you, when we stand before God on that day of judgment, and God says, why should I allow you into my heaven? You're just going to say, Lord, I've been saying to you for the last 50 years, only Jesus. That's the only place I can go is Jesus. That's all I've got is Jesus. It wasn't my fasting. It wasn't my prayer. It wasn't my obedience or the law or the passion or church or singing or praises or miracles or power. It was Jesus. All I've got, Lord, is Jesus. And God will say to you, and that's all you need. And that's all you ever could have had. It's always only Jesus. So therefore, since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God bless you. I hope that you will seriously consider this. And ask questions so that we can clear, clarify just exactly what we're talking about.